It's, it's such an amazing thing that we do every day. And um, just the opportunity, we were so disappointed when, when our world changed so much with the COVID restrictions. It's just a real treat to be here tonight. It's gonna to be quite informal, but um, I'd love to answer any questions that you've got. The Diggers Club is an amazing um, business we've been running for 41 years. Um, we've been started by Clive and Penny Blazy. They started in this tiny little shed in Melbourne, um, just in a little garage with all these different kinds of jars of seeds. And they started an amazing kind of garden club. Um, our mission, I suppose, is to really assist gardeners, Australian gardeners, in having beautiful and productive gardens. We want you to succeed at gardening and love it just as much as we do. Um, the Diggers Club has been around for a while. Even, even someone like me, I can remember um, sowing Diggers seeds as a kid with my dad as I was growing up. So there's an amazing legacy and it has gone from strength to strength over many years. Um, it is now at a point where in Victoria we've got um, three different retail outlets, but we're mainly a national company, so we're online. You'll find us at that link there at www.diggersclub.com.au. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's just amazing to be part of a bigger gardening community. Um, and also it's an amazing legacy that Penny and Clive Blazy have started in Australian gardening too. Um, over time, they have actually gifted two significant um, properties for preservation to a foundation, the Diggers Foundation. And so if you ever have an opportunity when you're down this way to visit our beautiful garden at Heronswood, which is on the Mornington Peninsula, or our, uh, another beautiful garden at the St Gardens of St Earth, which is in Blackwood in central Victoria. Those are two properties that um, Clive and Penny Blazy have gifted to the Diggers Club Foundation so that gardens and garden traditions can be preserved. So it's quite, you know, an amazing kind of gift that, and generosity that they've given, um, given us and given our gardening community. But I think that is true um, for many gardeners, that generosity of spirit. And, you know, we have gone from strength to strength as the Diggers Club. We're very well known for heirloom seeds. I've got a little bit of, I've got a bit of prop tonight. I was just explaining to Kate before. I'm very good at gardening, okay at technology. So there's no PowerPoint, but I do have some beautiful props to show. So the Diggers Club is often well known for all of these beautiful heirloom varieties of seeds. So we have always championed heirloom seeds. And we often get a lot of questions as to, to what is an heirloom seed. And I often explain, um, explain it this way, that heirloom varieties of vegetables are things that have been passed down from generation to generation. So you might inherit an important piece of jewellery from a grandparent or something like that. Or you can, as a gardener, inherit these amazing varieties, old world, beautiful different kinds of pumpkins of all different shapes and sizes, tomatoes of all different kinds of colours. These are really old, unique varieties of um, vegetables that have been passed down from different kinds of gardening communities over time. And so we're very fortunate to have really pioneered heirloom varieties um, in Australia with all their diversity and all their wonder. Um, what's very important about heirloom varieties of seeds is that they're open pollinated. So that means that it's very easy if a gardener follows the correct principles and of saving seeds, that they can actually save those seeds and use them again and again in each, each gardening season that they want to do. So it's quite a special and significant thing. Um, what we love about heirloom varieties of seeds at the Diggers Club is that they really not only have that diversity and wonder, you know, it's quite amazing to be able to see carrots that are black and purple and red and yellow, and you have all of that wonder there, but you've also got flavor. And, and I know our seasons are very different compared to where I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you from the Mornington Peninsula to mainly, I think a lot of people here tonight are in Southeast Queensland and around that area, uh, apart from the UK. <laughs> But there's, you know, when we think about heirloom varieties of seeds, we often think about flavour. 
because these are old varieties of vegetables that have been passed down from generation to generation. They're not a variety that has been bred to be transported in a truck, to sit on a supermarket shelf and to kind of, and to have that kind of shelf life in a supermarket. These are old varieties that, you know, they've been bred and shared so that you can simply take them from that plant and bring them in. And I think that it's quite a wonderful thing to, you know, to have that flavour and that diversity and wonder that you can get from heirloom varieties. And I suppose that's kind of where we have developed our philosophy on ornamental gardening at the Diggers Club, um, where it's, it's not just about, um, it's not just about how something looks, but it's about how something performs. So it's not about how that plant necessarily looks in a pot when you purchase it, but it's also about how that plant performs in your garden and how, and that experience that you have of that plant in your garden. Um, and I think we often think that there's not really just um, that, you know, it doesn't need, ornamental gardening doesn't need to just be restricted to the flowers that you grow. It can also be in the vegetables that you grow as well. Because if you go onto our website, if you're not familiar with us, you'll be able to see a whole kaleidoscope of colour and texture and wonder, you know, silver beet that has five different colours within that mix, you know, beautiful different structural kales, like tomatoes of all different kinds of colours. There's really quite a lot of diversity there. And the edible can be ornamental. And often uh, we are really delighted to see photos from our members in different ways that they've actually been able to use edible gardening to create something that's quite picturesque. And I'm sure the gardeners here tonight would have examples in their own gardens too, where something that is edible is really quite beautiful and amazing as well. But um, other than getting caught up in talking about vegetables tonight, I kind of thought it'd be really great just to talk about some general principles on, you know, gardening for beauty or having an ornamental, beautiful garden um, and ways that we can do that really sustainably in simple ways. And so I'm just going to discuss a few principles and I might use examples that might not fit the region where you are, but we can take the principle and see how we can apply in your own garden um, and because I think that there's something really magic when there's a person in their garden they can really you know experience their wonder and it's re a really you know, for me I even find um, even though I'm a horticulturalist um, gardening is really that mix of art and science where you have, you're working with something that's in the natural world. So you have that science and that practice that you use to grow that plant, but there's this creative element as well of how you plant that or what you combine it with. There's that real mix of art and science. And, and I think as I'm developing growing as a gardener, because I think we all are on that journey, I don't think you ever get to a point where you know enough about plants. And, and I suppose that's why it's so wondrous. Um, I think when we think about gardening, you're always learning and it's about developing some of those skills as an artisan or, a, you know, as, a, as an artist in your garden of how to bring those different things together. And so I'm going to give you a few principles today to maybe consider and, and help you in having a beautiful, cohesive garden, but something that's personal and something that you love. Um, we have different, we're very lucky, as I said, to have several gardens that we work in at the Diggers Club. Um, we've been very proud to have trialled a lot of varieties over different stretches of time, whether they're vegetables or whether they're flowering perennials. And it's amazing to just be able to have a crack and have a practice and, you know, really look at why, the ways that a garden can kind of come together. Um, but I think the main principle when we talk to gardeners whether they're new whether they're budding whether they're quite experienced and you may be anywhere along this spectrum tonight i think one of the most important um, principles especially if you're starting you know new garden or you're reinvigorating another garden is just to take a moment and reflect on the purpose or the reason as to why you're doing that garden so purpose like we can often get caught up with 
a particular garden that we want to create. But often it's really good just to have that moment where you reflect and consider how you want that garden to make you feel, but also how much time, what you want to actually do with the, garden, with the garden, what's your capacity to do with the garden. So for someone like me, I want to, you know, experience something quite whimsical and magical as I kind of spend time in my garden. And I also have a lot of time to invest in my garden too. So I'm one of those tinkerers. I love tinkering at my garden all the time, little doing bits and pieces all the time. But you may be someone that just wants a set and forget garden or, you know, there's different, there's different things that you might want to actually get from the garden or different things that you want to feel when you're in the garden. So it's often a lovely opportunity to have a bit of time, um, you know, consider what you want to get from the garden, how you make, want it to make you feel, whether you want it to be a really beautiful space that kind of envelops you, or whether you want it something to be very calm and structured to have that respite at the end of a busy day. It's really up to you. There's no um, rights and wrongs in, in gardening, especially when it's your own backyard. And, and that's kind of part of the wonder of it too. So I think definitely considering purpose and what you want that garden to do is a really key kind of fundamental um, principle when it comes to ornamental gardening. And I think the second one, and we've got experienced gardeners with us tonight, enthusiasts, and so I'm sure you would know this to be true. But I think one of the most important things when it comes to gardening and gardening sustainably is really, um, is really looking after the soil that the knowledge and the understanding that we have of soil ecology is just growing every single year. We know that it's this amazing complex biome of, of wonder that's happening in that soil. And I think that um, an old nursery man said it to me once, and I think it's always true that um, what you don't worry about feeding the plant unless you, uh, unless you haven't first fed the soil. It's the most important thing to do is to feed the soil and to look after the soil and really encourage that soil to develop and to create something wonderful in that soil. Um, and when that soil is really at its optimum, plants will really perform. So plants will really perform um, if they're in an amazing healthy environment and they're you know, and they're really, they've got everything they need from that soil. And so I think that's the most, uh, I think that's probably one of the most important second principles when it comes to ornamental gardening, is to really um, invest a lot of time and energy, whatever you have or resources to looking after that soil and plants will really perform from that point. Um, I think a third principle when it comes to developing and tending, um, ornamental gardens is to really consider the plant selection. And so someone like me, I've, I've been gardening for quite a few years professionally. I like pushing the boundaries of plants. I like experimenting and seeing what can actually happen in a space. But um, a happy and healthy plant will really perform. And there's a lot of information out there, you know, when you're looking at labels and when you're considering that selection for that area that you're, you know, that you want to develop, that you want to create an amazing garden, it's really important to actually select plants that will perform in those conditions. Um, though as gardeners, sometimes you want to uh, stretch those boundaries, it's quite, you know, it's quite great to actually set up that plant for success, to really encourage that plant to grow and to thrive. If we're, if we're putting shade loving plants into shade areas, if we're putting full sun plants into full sun, um, positions. It's just a very simplistic example, but when we consider what the plant's needs and wants are, and we're finding that perfect place to put them, or alternatively, considering that site that we really want to garden and what the ideal plant would be for that position, we're really setting ourselves up for those plants to do their best for us and to really show us their wonder and be healthy and successful over time. I I, I know I'm kind of rambling through a little bit. Is there any questions so far about anything I've men mentioned? No, we're all good. Great, excellent. 
Jack, I'll ask a quick question. Please yeah. Plant selection, how do you stay disciplined to your plant selection? It's hard, isn't it? <laughs> do, you work, do you work with a colour theme or do you work with a particular style? Yes, I think, and I'm, I will touch base on this, but I think, I think really getting a clear idea of, of what that purpose is, what you actually want to create in that garden space. Um, I think colour and that coherence is really quite um, important. Um, but if you have a bit of a scheme in your mind, and often you'll see it um, with interior designers, often they can create mood boards and they'll, you know, cut up anything that kind of takes their fancy. If you're developing a new garden or you're looking for a bit of inspiration, you can actually create your own vision of what you want that garden to do or how you want it to make you feel, whether that's a mix of particular colours, your favourite colours, or whether it's particular, um, particular textures or particular shapes or things that you really want to evoke in that garden. I think having a real clear vision before you get into that nursery is, um, is really quite key. And to have that patience, um, I think if, if, that, if that perfect plant isn't there to go on a bit of a hunt and, um, and hopefully in October at Botanic Bazaar, there'll be more of an opportunity to bring your garden dreams there and to see what you can find for those things. I think, I think the dis discipline, and, and I, feel a bit, I feel a bit hypocritical saying it because I'm as worse as anyone else here tonight <laughs> in terms of demonstrating discipline. But I think um, being really clear about that position and this space that you do actually have, because I think that's what I've learned over time is that, you know, I think you can often get into a trap, especially if you've got a small space, in really squashing all the plants together. And that can look really good for the first year, but those plants really do need that space. Um, as per the label and instructions that come with those plants to really kind of blossom. I, I think so having a bit of a vision, taking that time to really have a bit of time to think about what you want and then being able to pl match plants to it when you go into that nursery or when you're looking online for plants. But then also I think there, you know, you shouldn't restrict yourself. If you do go and you, you might just see a little bit of that spark of wonder when you are in that nursery or you are looking in different gardens and our botanic gardens are amazing examples of that to go and view different plants. It's, it's okay to also go with those wins. I think um, touching on colour, I suppose it also kind of comes the next important principle, I think, when it comes to bringing in a beautiful ornamental garden together is to consider design and the combination of plants. So I'm going to show you another picture. So this is of our beautiful Heronswood border um, down in Dramana in the Mornington Peninsula. This is our perennial, summer flowering perennial border. So you can see some beautiful sedums in the background here, agastaches of different colour and form in the front. I think um, one of the key principles um, of bringing a garden together is to consider the combination of plants that you're bringing. So you bring these different plants together and I think it's important to think about how those different forms and the foliage and the shape of those plants will actually meld together. And so, you know, we often, when we think about plants at diggers, we think about those plants and their shapes in kind of a few kind of key shapes. So you've got things that are very vertical and upright. You might have things that are mounding, like a bit of a dome. You'll have things that are airy that you can actually see through. So it might just be like gaura or, or different plants that blossom up that you can see through them. Um, or you might see plants that are quite strappy or, or plants that are also kind of a bit mat like So um, shape, plants, when they grow, will create these certain shapes in our landscape. And so when we pull them together in a garden, we want to consider not just what that individual will look like, but how they will look when they're placed together with different neighbours and they can create different effects when you're pulling them together. 
and one of the tricks I think um, in especially pulling a garden together is to try and get those different heights right across a garden because you can often get like a balcony effect where you know you've got all these plants of a certain height and then they just kind of drop off a ledge onto different plants and so you know really considering the heights of plants and their mature heights as well and how they can kind of combine and so one of the tricks that I've used um, when I am setting up gardens is you can even get bamboo poles or stakes or or things because sometimes it's hard to visualize how those different like different forms and different heights will actually sit together in a garden and so you can and and it, it does look a bit crazy to your neighbors <laughs> but i think we've all been out in our pajamas in the front yard anyway so i think we've already passed that one um so um you can actually represent shapes and forms of those different plants in your garden when you're doing a bit of planning and I even use like little bamboo poles and things like that where I'll actually go and stick them in the ground and kind of get them to the correct height of what that plant will be when it's mature. And it just gives me an indication of how that plant and its form will sit together in that landscape in comparison to different plants. And I think it's, I want to give you some design principles, but I also don't want to hold you back because one of the beauties of gardens is that it's a personal expression and so there's different principles we can apply but it's really i think don't hold back from any kind of experiments that you want to do in your own garden that's the wonder and joy of gardening of that having that expression of creating something that we see as beautiful but i think really considering how the what the shape that plants form but also how it actually structurally looks when you look at all of those different shapes grouped together in the garden and what's also very interesting is that as well as those um, plants having particular shapes that they form um, and you often see this particularly with herbaceous perennials so things like salvias and sedums these amazing plants that kind of have this wow factor over our warmer months and then and then kind of pull back a bit um, you will often see that they will form their own particular kinds of shapes but when you plant them together and this is actually a good example of it is that the, we've got agastache plants here so they are actually have like quite a upright vertical form but when we've actually grouped them together and planted them, can you see how they're actually creating like a plane of colour across here? And instead of in the sedum joys in the back, they've got quite a mounding form, but when they are mass planted like that, they actually create that nice bigger kind of rounded dome form too. So I would recommend like you can even it's kind of good to go out and about whether you're going to your beautiful botanic gardens that are close by or you're walking through your neighborhood you can kind of put your design eyes on and you'll see um, different plants in the street and in different environments and you'll be able to kind of take some mental notes of actually how does that strappy plant look with that mounding plant how does that you know we've got a whole big mass planting of strappy cannas or gingers or something how does that actually look do i look does it does that feel good do i like what i'm seeing you can kind of get your design eyes on as you're going on adventures and, and seeing different gardens and that's something that i'd really highly recommend i think we're probably people that are already avidly going um, and visiting different gardens and botanic gardens always have amazing examples but that's a good way of kind of looking at shapes and forms that are in gardens and how we could then use those different shapes and forms to create something wonderful at home yeah yeah um i think um oh uh, yeah i often think just about it and it, that is the real thing when it comes to combining plants that art form of how to you know get them all together and you don't we often think about when we work with a lot of herbaceous perennials, and this might, in, in the area that you're gardening in, you'll have your own different varieties of plants that are commonly planted, but, but perennials are an amazing one, 
is that you can kind of also think when you're thinking about your garden, you want to create something quite beautiful. You can consider um, planting things in, I'm going to show you kind of three different examples. But the way that you actually plant plants will create different effects and create different, you know, different scents as you plant it. And so we can see in this image that we have big drifts of plants. We have big masses. So that's not just one plant. That's many several plants planted right through there. All those different agastachys are planted through there. So we often refer to that as a drift or, so, you know, a big clump of plants, a big mass planting in one area. So you can plant in drifts where you have this big zone or area of that particular variety, or there's different ways to plant. So this is an example of one of our beautiful gardens, our display garden that we'd actually grown for Mythicus, but we couldn't do it. So we set up a little myth, mini Mythicus at the Heronswood at, um, at our HQ. And so you can see that there's a similar colour palette of plants. So a very similar colour, like lots of pastel colours, just like the other plant, um, other kind of garden there. But instead of these big drifts, we have lots of different kind of interplanting. So we've got, you know, instead of like having a massive clump, we've got like smaller clumps in different communities of plants that have all been melded together. And this is a third example. This is my home garden. Um, it doesn't look like this right now because it's all in its dormancy, but it's a bit tricky to see. But I've got similar plants like these echinaceas. You can see them when those little kind of ballet skirts there. Instead of planting them in big drifts or smaller kind of communities of plants, they're actually dispersed right throughout the garden so they're actually interplanted so they're actually intermingling in between other kind of big blocks of planting and so it's not sometimes just that shape of the plants that you've got in your garden that to consider when you're creating something ornamental um, it's also interesting to kind of play and experiment in the ways that you're actually going to plant them so you can plant them in big drifts where you have a big impact of colour here and colour here, or you can have these little repetition of blocks of colours or something um, that's more integrated and it looks a bit more whimsical or naturalistic. So it looks like something that you might see in nature in a, you know, in wildflowers or a meadow or something like that. And you have that interplanting where you've got all those plants kind of combined and you have that repetition of plants and there is something about that repetition that really, like, that, that it can be quite embracing. Yeah, yeah. So there's different things to kind of consider and play with. I think um, when, it, when it comes to ornamental gardening, colour is probably one of the best things to consider, just as Kate was saying before, in terms of creating that discipline or what, what you'd like to do when you actually um, consider that planting or that group of plants, that palette of plants. Um, if you're a bit new to colour, um, there are some amazing theory, there are some amazing kind of tools and theories out there around colour, different ways that different colours make us feel. Um, at Heronswood, you can see that, that the colour palette that we use here is very pastel. It's very pastel. One of the main reasons that it has this kind of colour, pastel colour palette at Heronswood is that it's summer flowering. And so similar to where you are in, in South East Queensland and in that region, that, cool, that kind of pastel colours actually has a cooling effect. And so most of our visitors visit these gardens during our peak summer time. And so we use a lot of cool pastel colours to actually create, create that cooling sense in the garden. And so colours can not only just be things that we're really attracted or drawn to, they can actually create a sense in the garden as well. And we often use a lot of greys um, in our plantings too. And that actually connects a lot with the location of, of where Heronswood is. It's on a coastal area. It has a really big blue sky. You see the sea a lot and having that contrast of that silver foliage kind of ties the garden together in a different way. Um, 
So some of these principles um, that I'm discussing tonight are actually in our complete flower and garden book. And so you can see here um, that it actually discusses colour and that colour wheel um, in more detail. Um, you know, you can really choose different colour palettes, um, but I think it's quite a personal choice as well. And I, um, you know, you can even get to the point where, you know, you are borrowing a few paint samples and things like that, or those different paint cards are quite handy to just get a sense of what different colours work with each other and what things that could really combine. But it encourage you, if you're interested in colour, definitely to do a little bit more research and, and see what you can find and, and work out what that colour palette is, whether you want to do it in a mood board or something else that is quite wonderful. But I think if you choose a colour palette and you can confidently say, this is my colour palette, I'm going to use flowers of these, I'm going to use this colour and this colour in my garden, if you do that consistently, it really does create a sense of coherence in the garden. So it feels like when you're at Heronswood, there's these pastel colours um, right throughout our whole garden. And so it feels like the whole garden kind of pulls together in its one garden because there's this constant colour theme that goes through the whole garden. And so that's one really easy design trick to use in your own garden to create that sense of coherence or that it's all one garden. You don't necessarily need to use the same plants, though this is a different way of creating coherence in a garden. But you can bring all of these different colours or use these colours repetitively in the garden. And this is something... Um, that is quite like is a really great trick to kind of use so you might you might have a particular like when I think about my garden at home I've got this herbaceous perennial border at the front then I've got a hot courtyard so I've got lots of agaves and you know really amazing succulents that can really hack that heat and then I've got pretty kind of cottagey things in the back but they all kind of got the same color palette so even though the varieties that I grow in different areas of my garden are quite different and they're different plants, they've got different shapes, because they have that different colour scheme that kind of runs through the whole garden, it feels like it all belongs together. And what you'll often see, and this is true of the Garden of St Earth, is if you really want that coherence, if you want that garden to kind of really pull together, is it's not, it, you can use colour as one tool to do that, but you can also use um, repeated plantings too. So you might just consider that there's a few plants that you just really adore, that you love, that are real plants that you really perform so well in your garden that you want to use a lot of. If you use them throughout your garden in different ways, it will also pull the garden together as well. And that's what you'll often see with garden designers is that they might not have a massive palette of plants, like they might not have a lot of different varieties that you're using, but they'll use the same varieties in repetition right throughout the garden. And that will create that sense of that garden coming together. But um, I don't know about you, but I, I think more plants, the better. <laughs> and if you can get all of that, you know, all of those different varieties and experiment with different things and just bring it together with colour, that's one way of doing it as well. But, you know, I, I, you know, I don't want to sound like too much of a hypocrite either because I've definitely had my fair share of, of granny vomit gardens where you've just got colour gone everywhere and you love it and that's the main thing. <laughs> Um, I think just one other kind of key principle, I know that I've spoken about a lot, but I think, you know, having a sense of purpose, really exploring what you want to achieve in your garden, you know, looking after that soil so your plants will perform and consider permanent plantings like perennials, shrubs, things that will be there over time that will really stand up to the test of time and considering that design, that combination of plant shapes and also the colour and how that brings it together. I think another real great trick um, is mass planting when it, when it comes to gardens. And I have been a renter gardener um, for many years until now. 
there's different ways of creating mass in your garden um, and it doesn't necessarily need to be a big investment to get there it can just take time but I think as you can see um, in any of these examples whether it's our heronswood border whether it's my front garden whether it's our mini Mifcus garden there is a large quantity of plants here and it's not and you don't need to see any of the mulch or anything below the plants either it really is very plant full or it's maximum plant and i think that that's quite a wonderful thing to have in a garden is to really have it so full of plants and planting in mass has a real sense of confidence to it where you have a lot of those beautiful varieties that you're planting them in big groups or you're planting them in repetition around in your garden. I think that that's quite a wonderful thing to be able to do. And, you know, it is achievable. Like a lot of our perennials, you know, whether they're cannas or gingers, um, whether they're sedums or salvias, or they are actually quite, it, it is a bit of a skill to develop over time, but they are, quite um, plant, easy plants that are easy to propagate and reproduce. And so I'm quite cheeky, but I'll often get a six inch plant and divide it into three or four. Um, and that it just getting on top of that propagation and, and seeing what you can divide and seeing what you can do little soft tip cuttings of and what you can grow of seed, you can really develop that mass, um, those, those multiple plants that can really create those wonderful effects as well. And I think I just want to touch on annuals um, because I have spoken a lot about herbaceous perennials and plants that, that can be permanent features in your garden. And that, that's great because it does save you a lot of work if you've got something that's permanently there that can just flourish over the years. But I think there's a real spot for annuals when it comes to a lot of our gardening. I often think about annual flowers as a bit there. I feel like they're almost like the Swiss army knife of gardening annuals because you can just use them in so many different ways whether that's having whether you've got somewhere in your veggie patch that you want to be do a big stand of sunflowers or grow those hardy performing zinnias to create those cut flowers or use californian poppies they've got those fine leaves and they really can mesh your garden quite well together if you've got all of these little gaps or something some californian poppies they'll start flowering in eight weeks and you can create, they can mesh things quite well. So annuals are often a really wonderful like Swiss army tool that you can use in different ways to kind of bring a garden together. And I think that that's also something that's a bit underrated. A lot of those annuals only come, you know, one packet of seeds and you can create a lot of wonder from a packet of annuals. And that's an art, also something wonderful like you can have the calendula that grows in different areas of your garden or you can have cosmos with their beautiful airy nature like in different sections of your garden that's a really easy way to have those that kind of seasonal color that comes through but then also have them repeated through the garden in different ways and so not to be underrated the annuals <laughs> Excellent. And um, I just wanted to mention annuals too, because it's an exciting time of year for us at the Diggers Club. We've released our seed annual. So it is a yearly magazine that we send out to all our members and it celebrates all things seed. So all of our beautiful varieties of vegetables that I've mentioned, a lot of those amazing annual flowers, you'll see them all inside and they're available on our website. And so I think during this COVID time, um, it has really drawn us back to gardening and there's something so joyous and wondrous about growing something from seed. And we have advice to help you with that. You might not have had success, but we're here to help you with what you need just to give it another crack. Because I think that that is one of the challenges of gardening. You might not always get it right. Like I, I kill plants too, don't tell anyone. But um, it's always about being able to have another go and to take what you've learnt and just to apply that into your garden day to day. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. But is there any questions, Kate? Do you have anything to touch on? Would anybody like to unmute themselves and ask Jack a question before we finish up? You're very welcome.
Just to, I have a question. You, you mentioned um, one of the one of the key principles is making sure your soil's right. I always struggle with. Yes, I can test for alkaline or acid, but how do I test for nitrogen, phosphorus? Yeah. Nitrogen? How do you test for all those things to know that you've got the right balance? I think it's quite tricky, um, but I think the main rule of thumb when it comes to healthy soil is organic matter, because whether you've got a high or low um, uh, you know, pH levels in your soil or whether you've got, you know, different textures, whether it's sandy or clay, depending on where you're living. If you're regularly adding organic matter to your soil, it's actually buffering the plants. It actually creates a nice buffer for the plants, whether it's that different texture or anything. And that's probably the main thing that I'd take away. Even as a horticulturalist, I just don't have the time or the resources to test for things like nitrogen. So I'm just consistently adding... Um, adding organic matter all the time and so whether that's me adding organic matter as I'm doing my next veggie bed or um, I've cut back all, a lot of my perennials um, and it may be a different time for you in Queensland as to when you cut different perennials back but I've already cut mine all back and I've given them a really big mulching with really good quality compost and compost that have made it home myself and so that's just one way you can actually chop dress your soil you can actually mulch with really good quality compost and the soil will incorporate that organic matter over time and so even if you've got something that you've already got a permanent planting or plants that you've planted into your garden um, it's really great and wonderful to be able to you know to um, really just always add organic matter to your soil every year just always add it you'll never regret it <laughs> more the merrier i can see i've got some other questions here too um absolutely we've got a really good question coming through about soaking seeds um, absolutely um, when you do have larger seeds like broad beans peas sweet peas they do, beans, they do tend to have that really hard outer shell and some other rare varieties you might plant as well that have that really bigger, harder shell. They do benefit from soaking overnight. I usually don't do it for longer than 12 hours um, and I usually just soak those seeds in warm water and you will find that they do germinate um, a little faster because that cuticle, that outer layer of that seed has already absorbed a lot of that moisture. So you've already given it a bit of a head start so yeah absolutely soaking seed, soaking those larger seeds in in soil but if if you're also a busy person doesn't matter just get those seeds in that's the main thing but yeah that that soaking overnight can definitely assist excellent awesome you checking in to sorry i'm just reading questions <laughs> excellent Great, excellent. I love that comment from Diane about, um, you know, perennials and, and just to fill the spaces with colour because you can't go wrong. Like I've planted different things that haven't quite worked in my garden and I just simply dig them up and give them to my friends and family. So there's no loss when it comes to different varieties. Excellent. Um, also thinking about I want to garden with the soil, how often should you be checking it? So checking it in terms of organic matter or I reckon probably I just kind of get into a bit of a routine when it comes to checking the soil. So, so um, I just regularly add that organic matter. So any time that I am in my veggie patch, if I'm changing the crops at all, I'm adding organic matter. But with my permanent planting, like with my perennials, I'll usually mulch with that heavy compost maybe twice a year, right before summer to really ensure that those um, plants are going to be benefit from a bit of that protection but then I also do it after I've cut things back just to give it, them a bit of a boost before they start performing again. Excellent, awesome. Do you use bulbs? Yes I do use bulbs. Oh I can't believe I didn't mention bulbs. <laughs> For me, I think one of the wonderful things about gardening is that you've got all these different things in your toolbox. So you've got your Swiss Army knife, which is, which is your annuals that you can use in many different ways. But we also have a lot of different things that can add different seasonal interest to our garden. So at Heronswood, for example, that border that I showed, there's mainly just perennial plants. But in my home garden at home, and I see this in many other gardens too, 
it's, you know, there's no rules. So I've got a mix of perennials. I've got some shrubs. I've got, you know, I've got different annuals that I sprinkle through, but I've also got bulbs that will add that seasonal interest. So I've got autumn flowering bulbs, but then I've also got spring flowering bulbs as well, because they're the ephemeral things like annuals, bulbs, they just add different seasonal highlights throughout the year. Because I don't, I don't want to get too complicated tonight, but I think a wonderful kind of gardening that you can achieve over time is just to have that year-round garden. You've kind of got something that's happening in all seasons. So whether it's particular plants flowering or the colour of bark or leaves during a certain time of the year or these little um, bulbs that emerge over time or your Californian poppies flowering. It's wonderful to be able to have different interests throughout the seasons. And so bulbs are something that are part of that toolbox that you can really add to it. And they can really create that kind of wonder. And there's nothing better than if you've got different areas is just to have those seasonal things emerge. And, and bulbs and annuals and all of these plants, I think it's just so wonderful in your garden that you can have all of this different interest over time in your garden. So go out there, experiment. Yeah, you've got some amazing things that will flower up well up, well up there that, that we struggle to flower and hit the epistrums and everything. So you've got, you've got lots of fun to play with, yeah. Jack, thank you for that. We're just about out of time, um, but you know, we all love our gardens and we're all, we're all challenged sometimes by, by, our, by our environment, but you're right, there are, some beautiful plants that we've got access to here in South Eden, at South East Queensland as well. And, and, you know, it's, there's so much choice and it is, I always find it hard to be disciplined because I have an idea, but then I see something else I love. So it's, it's, it's hard to stay away from that, but, but thank you for your energy and thank you to the Diggers Club as well. Um, oh, we've got a last question there about salvias. Do you want to quickly? Mm, to yes, absolutely. Yeah, this girl, right. Yep. Excellent. So salvias, salvias a glorious plant that we love so much here at the Diggers Club that will perform really well in your area. I think um, salvias come, it's such a diverse group of plants. So salvias, you know, you've got your little nemorosas, which is your little ground, um, ground, you know, performing herbaceous perennials. You've also got more woody varieties. That's such a diverse group of plants that are salvias. And so there are some salvias that will grow bigger um, over time. I do two different techniques. So I'm, I'm really, I'm a bit of a hard ass. I really do prune those salvias back once a year to get that new flush of growth. And so I do do like a regular cut back on them. But also um, during my um, time, I often like, once my salvias start get, getting going for the season, I'll often do a tip prune, um, and this might be of use for you just to kind of contain that hide, is when they first get going, you can kind of prune them back or just prune as like maybe a third off the plant just as they start to get going and to grow. And that will encourage, that will reduce their height a bit, but then that will also encourage the amount of blooms that they have on their plant as well. So you get that extra flowering. But salvia is like, I've, you know, they can take a lot of tough love and so at the end of the season, giving them a really hard cut back will really kind of keep their woody growth um, down depending on what variety you're growing. But they're glorious plants and definitely a wonderful group of plants to explore because they have so many different colours and so many different forms and different ways they perform in the garden. So enjoy them. Yeah. Fabulous. Thanks, Jack. I love my salvias as well. Mm. So thank you very much. Um, Please, you know, on behalf of the Rotary Club of Gold Coast and the Botanical Bazaar, we hope to see you all on October the 4th. Stay engaged with our Facebook page. Uh, we'll have another virtual gardening workshop within the next two to three weeks. So, so stay tuned for that one. And again, Jack, thank you very much. I um, really appreciate your time tonight and for sharing your energy and ideas. And I think we've all, we've all, got, a, we've all got something from that. What is a bazaar from Beat? Um, the Botanical Bazaar is the Gold Coast Annual Garden Festival that's held at Narang. Um, it's, it's held Saturday the, this year, Saturday the 4th of October. Uh, we'll have lots of exhibitors, some fabulous keynote speakers there as well, and it's a really beautiful family day for all. And what a perfect time of year, just coming into spring as well. 
So thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody who's attended tonight. And um, we look forward to you coming back and we look forward to your feedback as well. And please feel free to post on Facebook any ideas or reviews um, or thoughts that you may have or like to see in future virtual workshops. Um, and Jack, if I can just ask you to, to stay online and we'll have a quick chat afterwards. Good night, everybody. Stay warm. Good night.